Hello, <clears throat> it's uh, great to be here today. Uh, it's a pity we can't meet in person, but I guess this is the next best thing. And so today I'd like to tell you about some work that we've been doing in our group on structure determination of amorphous molecular solids, so challenging systems uh, in powders using NMR spectroscopy. And this is the work of a, a large group of people uh, over many years. I like to give special mention to Manuel Cordova, uh, who's been doing a lot of the work that I'll talk about specifically today. And he's being supported by Penelope Muzzori, Martin Spaladis, Albert Hofstetter, um, and Bruno Shimos Dalmeida, together with Aditya Mishra and, and Pierrick Burier, Burier among, among others. And this is <clears throat> my group, it's an NMR group, and so we're in a high field. It's part of a larger collaboration with people uh, both inside and outside EPFL. Uh, so I'd like to give it also a special mention to Michele Ceriotti and his group at EPFL. I'll be talking about the work we've been doing with them. And uh, outside uh, EPFL, Graham Day in particular has been a driving force for uh, a partnership for a lot of this work. And um, Stefan Chance and his group uh, in AstraZeneca have been providing us with challenges over the last decade or so. And I'll also be talking about some work that we've done with Karen Scrivener inside EPFL, as well as, my, as, well as Michael Gretzel and his group um, uh, uh, at, at EPFL. So <clears throat> what we'd like in uh, structure determination is really to be able to go from um, a powder <clears throat> together with a chemical structure and then be able to get on some kind of magic carpet and go to a full three-dimensional crystal structure of the material. Now, what some of you probably don't know is that actually we can do this today with NMR spectroscopy. And so this is what we call NMR crystallography. And uh, we're going to do this by um, measuring experimental parameters. So the experimental constraints on the structure will be NMR chemical shifts. So here, for example, in carbon uh, and proton NMR. And then there'll be a process by which we can transform those chemical shifts into the full three-dimensional structure. And here I'm showing the, one of the first examples done by Maria Bayesh when she was working in the group. And this is the de novo full structure of AZD8329. And you know it has all of the attributes we'd like for a crystal structure, including uncertainties on the positions. Here the RMSD is about 0.17 angstroms. And a measure of confidence in the structure. And here this is, we're 100% confident that this is the correct structure. Now, the way we do this is through a workflow that's become fairly standard in my group today. And I'd just like to very quickly go over some of the main points. I won't be talking a lot about the measure, the experimental side uh, of the, the NMR, where we need to measure and assign chemical shifts from powder samples. This is still a challenge today. It's still something that we're doing a lot of work on. Uh, dynamic nuclear polarization has really helped in this area to increase sensitivity and allow us to make uh, assignment in powders uh, more and more straightforward over the years. For this audience, actually, I want to talk more about the structure determination side of the process and how we do that. And the first step is to generate a comprehensive ensemble of candidate structures. It doesn't really matter how we do this. And this is something that you've been talking about a lot this week in this symposium. Uh, the most maybe elegant and satisfying way is to have a complete comprehensive ensemble of candidate structures generated without any prior knowledge. And that's uh, something that we've been doing with uh, or using with uh, the methods developed by Graham Day uh, over the last decade or so. Once you have that group of candidate structures, then what we need to do is to be able to calculate chemical shifts. And I'd like to spend more time talking about chemical shifts calculations today and how that actually allows us to do things we couldn't really do before with some recent developments. Once we have the calculated chemical shifts, <clears throat> then it's very simple, as with any other structure determination method, we'll compare the experiment with the model predictions, and that's the way we determine the structure from the ensemble of candidates. So let me start with a simple question. <clears throat> I bet that most of you in the audience today could give me a pretty good guess if I ask you, you know, what's the chemical shift of this methyl group in this compound? And I'm pretty sure that most of you would come up with a number, you know, something like one or two ppm. And in fact, yes, in this case, the chemical shift is, you know, 1.3 ppm for this methyl group. But that's not actually what we need to do for crystallography. If we want to determine structures among candidates, 
we have a much tougher question to answer. And I wonder if you can get this one. So what I'm really asking you is, can you tell me the difference between the chemical shift of the methyl group in this structure? So this might be one polymorph of a drug. And then in this structure, which might be another candidate structure. So can you tell me the difference in chemical shift between these two? And that's a much, much more difficult question. That's the kind of accuracy we need if we want to use chemical shifts to discriminate and to determine uh, complete crystal structures. <clears throat> now, the big step forward in this area was made with the introduction of accurate of initial chemical shift calculations. This is something that's been thought about for a long time. Uh, Ramsey in the 50s was the first one to think about it. And then Grant and Oldfield made very significant uh, steps forward in the 90s. I'm showing an example from, from a, a, a classic Grant paper here. Uh, but then the real step forward was made for us <clears throat> where by Chris Picard and Francesco Mori when they introduced a formalism to calculate chemical shifts in periodic crystal systems. And so that's extremely well adapted to the, to the uh, solid state NMR crystal structure determination problem. And this was a, a really big step forward for us. And then more recently, we've had very nice contributions from Greg Barron and his group and Len Muller, who have introduced fragment approaches, which are, uh, tend to be more accurate. And the more accurate we get, the better our structures will be. So what do we do? The approach is quite uh, straightforward in the sense that we'll take a, a candidate structure. So here we have a candidate structure for uh, a given compound. <clears throat> and we're going to compare uh, the measured and the predicted chemical shifts. Uh, and so you can see that in this case, this is a, an agreement that I would call not so good. Okay, so you can clearly see that there are some outliers uh, and the RMSD is about one PPM for protons. So it turns out that that's not in good agreement to within all of our errors. And so this structure would be discarded. This is not the correct structure. And then we have a second candidate here. So it's a different uh, structural candidate for the same molecule. And we see now that the comparison between the measured and the experimental chemical shift and, and the predicted chemical shift, sorry, is, <clears throat> is now very good. <clears throat> we have very good agreement. This is good agreement to within all of our errors. And so we would accept this as a candidate structure. And uh, if uh, things go well, then this will be the only structure that matches the data. And then we get an unambiguous determination of the structure that way. And so this is something that, that actually works very well today. So what are the strengths and advantages of these methods? Well, the real strength of these met methods is that we have very high accuracy. Okay, and that's what allows us to compare, you know, the different um, candidates. And here you see about 15 different candidates and to select the only one that's in agreement with the data. But the real disadvantage of these methods is the computational cost, which is still extremely high today and becomes prohibitive. So we go into, you know, thousands of CPU hours for larger structures. And here we can even see that there are structures that are just not accessible uh, using today's technology uh, with these methods. And for many applications, this is the bottleneck. We'd like to be able to speed up the calculations so that we could do maybe an order of two magnitude more calculations in different approaches. <clears throat> and so obviously in 2020, the way you'd probably think about doing that is to ask yourselves if, can we use machine learning to accurately predict chemical shifts in molecular solids? That's a good question. And machine learning has been used to predict chemical shifts in several applications previously. So uh, particularly in proteins and particularly in small molecule solution NMR. And why is that? Well, in both of those cases, there are gigantic uh, today experimental chemical shift databases that can be used as the training sets uh, for uh, machine learning algorithms. And so that works very, very well. However, there's a problem for molecular solids in that there is no experimental chemical shift database. So there's only very few um, uh, really reported chemical shifts. And we have, in addition to that, a vast chemical and combinatorial space. And we have a strong dependence for chemical shifts in general on the local environment. That's what makes them such good discriminators. So they depend on the bonding, the molecular conformation, and the crystal structures, crystal packing. And so we decided to take an approach to this, which was to use the Cambridge Structural Database as a source of structures. Of course, they haven't had solid state NMR done on them. We'll take structures from the CSD 
Then we're going to use DFT, the accurate DFT calculations to generate calculated chemical shifts for all of these structures or as many as we can do. So we started with 2000 structures. And we're going to hope that that's accurate enough to be able to train a machine learning algorithm that can then accurately predict experimental um, chemical shifts. And so we, that's the main innovation, I think, in the method that we've um, developed. We also use um, SOAPs to, as descriptors of the, um, uh, the, the environments. And so th this is well adapted to this chemical shift problem because these are um, local descriptors and the chemical shift is a local parameter. And we use GPR as our machine learning uh, algorithm, but of course you could probably use any other machine learning algorithm for this. And uh, others have been used since, since we did this work. And then in the process, obviously, we increase the number, as we increase the number of training structures uh, for the prediction algorithm, then we get lower and lower errors in the training set. And we then, uh, when we get up to 2,000 structures, in this case, now we're up to about 5,000 structures with the latest versions, we get very good uh, accuracy in reproducing. Here, what I'm showing is the reproduction of the DFT calculated chemical shifts as compared to the machine learning shifts in a test set. And we see we get very good, uh, very low errors for protons, carbon-13, nitrogen, and oxygen in this case. It's very encouraging. This now allows us to do what we wanted to do before. It produces a two or th for four orders of magnitude uh, increase in the speed of the calculation that was expected. And in particular, it now allows us to um, access these very large structures that we couldn't access before and which we can now compute uh, in, in a matter of seconds. And so we can actually access these structures, which are six of the largest structures in the Cambridge database. So this is uh, quite exciting. And then, of course, the important thing is that we can now compare this to experiment. And we can see that when we look at a benchmark set of uh, experimental chemical shifts, and this is a benchmark set that was introduced by Craig Barron and Len Muller, uh, then we, we also get a very good prediction of the experimental shifts using the machine learning model, even though the machine learning model never saw any experimental shifts in its uh, genesis. And so this allows us now to um, go forward and compare candidates with um, the experimental data and it allows us to select the correct structures using either the machine learning model or the GPO model. And here are three examples of that. And this is something you can try yourself. So you can go online. Uh, uh, we have a web server. And so you can go online and calculate your own chemical shifts for your own systems and, and see if it works. And please let us know if it doesn't. So just as a reminder, this is producing full three-dimensional uh, structures. Uh, here's the example of ampicillin. And as I said before, they have all the attributes now that, that you would like. So we have the structure, we have the positional errors. So here again, about 0.17 angstroms in RMSD, um, uh, which compares very well to the single crystal X-ray structure in, in this case. And we can assess confidence using Bayesian methods. And so here we have 95% confidence that this is the correct structure. And again, we obviously have the full unit cell and packing as, as part and parcel of this um, full crystal structure. Now, I did want to just come back and talk a little bit about the, um, the way we generate candidate ensembles. And so, as I said, we've been doing this with Graham Day. And for the pharmaceutical cases, we usually try and generate complete unbiased sets. Uh, and this is a very powerful method today. It's advancing very rapidly. But there is an interesting example in, for the ampicillin case. In fact, when Graham calculated the uh, ensemble, he actually missed completely the correct structure. Uh, and there's a, the reason for that is that in the gas phase, the first step of the CSP process, uh, there's a very strong intramolecular hydrogen bond that favors closed conformations of the molecule. Uh, and in the solid, there's a strong intermolecular hydrogen bond, which is actually more favorable 
okay, and which is the one we find in the correct structure. And so this means that because that in uh, term molecular hydrogen bond is not present in the gas phase, those structures appear with higher energy in the gas phase, and so they're excluded from the rest of the process. Obviously, in this experimental, when we're trying to determine experimental structures, we're not trying, we're, unbiased CSP is not our objective. And so what we'd like to be able to do, for example, is see if we can inject any experimental knowledge into the early steps of CSP, which would both accelerate significantly CSP, which is, which is a problem, CSP is very slow, and avoid us from excluding the correct structures. <clears throat> and so the way we thought about doing that um, is as follows. And it's a difficult problem because obviously we need to say something about the gas phase so the single molecule conformation, but we're only able to measure on the full crystal structure, okay? So the presence of cross peaks, for example, in head core spectra doesn't tell us much about the single molecule conformation if you don't know the structure yet. Whereas what we can show is that the absence of cross peaks does. And so here we see, for example, that the closed conformations, for example, will always have a short distance um, that we're highlighting here. So this distance will also always be short. Okay, and so the closed conformation will always yield this cross peak, for example. There's a particular cross peak. You can look at all of the different cross peaks in the molecule. The open conformation, however, can generate the same cross peak if there's an intermolecular contact, okay, which is short enough. Okay, but it's the only case where there might not be a cross peak if both the intra and the intermolecular distances are long enough. So if we don't see a cross peak in the heck core spectrum, it means that all of these distances are long. And so that this would, for example, exclude the closed conformation. The absence of the cross peak excludes the closed conformation in this particular case. So we can actually measure these constraints and add them in without knowing anything about um, the, the overall structure yet and provide constraints for the, the, the candidate generation process. And so in this case, we were able to do that. This excludes the closed conformations here and uh, means that now the open conformations uh, are included uh, in the uh, set of uh, conformations which have the lower energies now uh, and which have passed this filter and so it's included in the rest of the CSP. So the CSP is increased in, in, in speed by about an order of magnitude, but importantly, it no longer misses the wrong structure. Okay. <clears throat> but really the question I wanted to ask today is using these approaches, what can we do that we couldn't really do before? Okay, so let's try and go beyond uh, microcrystalline um, uh, powders of, of uh, small molecules, let's say. What can we do that we couldn't really do before? And so here are some examples from our group. The first one is the structure of uh, cementous, cementitious calcium silicate hydrates. So this is one of the main components in Portland cement. It's a very important material. And here we are able to show the first structure of CSH materials using this uh, approach. So again, we had candidate generation of these structures uh, using a BRIT model, uh, and we were able to compare the candidate structures with the experimental chemical shifts, and we can determine uh, this model. These are very challenging structures to determine because they have disorder. In okay, cases so in particular, there's disorder in the chain lengths, in the silicate chains, and there's disorder in the um, interlayer structure here, the hydrated interlayer structure. And we were able to um, effectively determine the uh, structure and the distribution of chain lengths present in the industrial relevant samples. And so this is the first structure of this material uh, that's been done at the atomic level. And then we were able to go on to this second example, which is uh, uh, calcium aluminate silicate hydrate, where we add um, uh, small amounts of uh, aluminum doping into the sample. This is a structure that had been debated for many years. And again, using these approaches, we were able to determine um, the full structure of, of these materials. So that's already uh, quite a challenging example. And then in my group, we have a uh, high interest at the moment in uh, determining the structures in perovskite solar cells. And here's another example that's very challenging. So here we have uh, layered 2D perovskites, these so-called Rolleston popper phases. 
in which we have uh, hybrid materials with organic spaces, uh, 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 which you can see here. And these organic spaces between the perovskite layers, the lead halide layers in this case, um, have usually well-defined structures and they can exist in different polymorphs potentially. So we can generate candidate structures for them. Uh, but it's very hard to determine the structure because the perovskite layers in particular are disordered and they can come as slabs of one, two or three layers. And there's usually a mixture in most samples of, of that uh, layering. And so this is again, a very challenging disordered system, but which has uh, structured uh, organic interlayers. How do we determine the structure of the interlayers? Well, we apply this same method. We don't depend on long range crystallinity. And this is actually interesting because here we're looking at a, a mixed spacer layered 2D perovskite with FEA and PEA uh, mixed into the layer. And we were expecting in this case to obtain structures where the two uh, aromatic groups were complementary and would stack in some complementary way between the phenyl ethyl ammonium and the two perfluoroethyl ammonium groups. And when we generate candidate structures, we find that none of the mixed structures agree with the data. So NMR says that none of those structures are correct. And the only structures that are in agreement with the data are where we have models where the PEA and the FEA are both actually in pure phases. So actually we determine that we have pure phases of PEA and then other regions with pure phases of FEA. The PEA is twisted and the FEA is parallel in these two twisted and parallel structures. And we have other information from NMR on distance constraints which show that they're actually very close in space. And so we conclude that we have nano segregation. So we have nano domains of the pure uh, spaces in well-defined structures in this material, in this kind of narcissistic structure where we get separate phases instead of a mixed phase. So uh, very interesting. <clears throat> but again, what I'd like to come finish with is, is maybe the, our biggest challenge. And the question is, can we determine the precise structure of amorphous solids, so disordered uh, molecular solids? And so here we have the example of um, this is hydrated amorphous uh, 5718 uh, drug in development in AstraZeneca. And so the question is, can we take that and actually determine some form of the disordered structure that's present in the material? And again, this is a, this is a tremendous challenge, I think, for any method. I'm not sure that we know how to do that. Let's take it step by step and see how we can do this with NMR. Okay, the first thing we see is that when we compare the um, anhydrous crystalline form with the amorphous hydrated form, uh, we see that the carbon chemical shifts are broadened. And the same thing when we look at the proton spectra, we see they're also broadened. So both of the carbon and the proton spectra are significantly broadened in the amorphous form, indicating disordered structures, okay? But then if we look more closely, we can see that the crystalline uh, anhydrate has the same chemical shifts as the amorphous form. And so this tells us that the basic structure is the same in both materials. So the basic structure doesn't change in going from the crystalline to the amorphous form of the drug. Okay, so that means we can determine the basic structure using the approach that we've talked about previously. And so we did that in this case, so we generated structures, selected them, and we find that this is the, um, the, the crystal structure of the material. And again, it has, it's, it's a very accurate structure and we have 99% confidence that this is the correct structure. So then how are we going to now incorporate disorder into this structure? We're going to look at the broadening caused by the chemical shifts and model that uh, into the uh, set of allowed structures that's compatible with that broadening. And in particular, of course, in this case, we're, we're particularly interested in this proton here. So we see that one major change in the, in the spectra is that this proton resonance has shifted to significantly higher PPM. And so this is going to be typical of um, a change in the hydrogen bonding interactions. And, and this is also my, what we might expect when we go to the um, hydrated form. And so the way we'd like to do this is to, in principle, determine a, a set of conformations, disorder conformations, um, by uh, combining an MD ensemble with the measured chemical shifts. Okay, and so the MD part is actually quite simple. So we can generate MD models of the amorphous structures uh, where we have 128 molecules 
of the drug and up to 132 water molecules in the unit cell. Okay, and so we can generate a, a whole series of MD runs, take snapshots from that and have some idea of what the structures could be. And then if we want to know what the structures are, we need to calculate the chemical shifts. And of course, the large cell size of the simulation cells and the large number of structures that we generate by MD makes DFT computation of chemical shifts just, I mean, it's just out of the question, something that we just can't imagine uh, doing today on all sorts of levels. But now with the machine learning model, in fact, we can just use the machine learning model to predict chemical shifts for the MD structures. And we've done that for 202 full, snail full cell snapshots. So that's 25,856 molecules of the drug and about 26,000 water molecules. And honestly, that, that to me, that just sounds ridiculous. So it, it, it's very exciting that we can do that now. And once we've done that, of course, we get a result, which is very interesting. So here, what I'm showing you are spectra on the left, which are classified according to the hydrogen bonding motifs that we find in the structures, which are shown in the center. And we can now select the structures which occur in the pink region here that I've highlighted, which corresponds to the experimental chemical shifts measured um, uh, in the proton spectrum. And you can see that that process favors, for example, the structures A, and that's reassuring because the A hydrogen bonding motif is the one that we find in the um, crystalline drug. But then what's very interesting is that the next uh, uh, most interesting structure is, is D, which is again, highly favored high chemical shifts. And D is the hydrogen bonding interactions, which now involve directly a water molecule instead of another copy of the drug molecule as the hydrogen bonding partner. And so this is uh, allowing us to determine the structures and probe the structures of the hydrogen bonding network involving the water in this amorphous hydrate. And so this is the result. This is an ensemble. So this is an atomic level uh, precision ensemble of structures that are present in the amorphous sample. Okay, and we can see these structures. We can see the hydrogen bonding network here and we can see the, 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 the partner uh, on the other side. And um, what's exciting is we can now go in and look in detail at the different structures that we get between the, uh, let's say the donor molecule, the, the, the water molecules, which are forming this hydrogen bonding network uh, with, the, with the part molecule on the other side and look at that in detail, and start to understand these structures uh, in terms of their structure and their energies, for example. And here's the, the other confirmation that I was talking about where we have a, um, a direct hydrogen bond between uh, the donor molecule and, and the acceptors on the other side. And again, we can go into these structures and look at the details of the interface and the, the interactions that are leading to these structures. So we can start to look at energetics. We can calculate relative formation energies, for example, here. Uh, that's what I'm showing you for the different uh, hydrogen bonding motifs. And so you can see that what's very interesting, for example, very quickly is that you can see that the, um, the hydrogen bonding interaction that involves water is in fact the one that stabilizes the structure the most. And so now we can understand why interactions with water stabilize, for example, the physical aging of the drug. And we're gonna be able to start to develop structure activity relations. So relating the, um, the disordered structures to the bulk properties of the drug uh, through this kind of study in the future. So obviously this is something that we're very excited about. Um, we think this has a very bright future and, and I hope you share that um, enthusiasm with me today. So actually that's all I wanted to really tell you about today. I want to uh, thank my group again uh, for their uh, contribution to this. So in particular, as I said, Manuel doing a lot of the computations that I talked about today. And the precursor work on shift ML was done with Michele Ceriotti's group by Federico and Albert, with Martins, Bruno uh, and Penelope uh, doing measurements uh, or to provide the experimental data that are driving these structures, of course. And then uh, we have Aditya and Michael doing the perovskites and um, uh, Penelope and Anna, uh, for example, together with Pierrick working on the, the cements uh, and, and another Brennan. And again, special mention to Stefan Schantz and his group at AstraZeneca, who've obviously been providing with us with these challenges uh, over the last uh, decade or so. And that's been a very fruitful 
endeavor. So finally, thank you for your attention, and I'd be glad to hear from you 